Can it be okay to be scared and triggered? Can I just welcome that? Because most of us are like, stop being scared, stop being threatened. We make that bad and wrong. So I just scared I'm triggered. No big deal. I'm just human. I mean, we're just, we're all so human here. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. But I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. The future is to those who take it. Welcome to this month's Fireside Chat, which we've actually shifted into a workshop because of the incredible work that Diana has been doing for the last several years deserves a much more interactive session. For those who don't know me, I'm, my name is Stephen Krein. I'm the CEO and managing partner of Startup Health, and I'm incredibly excited to not only share Diana's wisdom with you today through a very interactive session, but more importantly, give you a chance to ask questions directly, interact, and do some work. For those of you who are driving, it's going to be a little tough to do some of the worksheets that Diana is going to share with us today, but I'm excited because of the incredible work that Diana has been doing and has really outlined so beautifully in the book, The 15 Commitments to Conscious Leadership. One of our co-investors in a couple of our companies, Devoted Health and Cala Health or Verda Health, Tabriz Virgi, had highly recommended this book, mostly because it's how he lives his life and how he knows that the companies he invests in have CEOs that live that same life. So I'm going to introduce Diana. We're going to, we're going to do a little interactive work together. One of the reasons I was so moved by your book, Unity and I spent a lot of time talking about all of these entrepreneurs in our community, hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs are working on such meaningful work, but so many of them, like all of us, struggle sometimes with our own internal demons or limitations. And I just think each one of the chapters in your book and each one of the words that you've written and almost every one of the videos that I've watched that you've created has touched on this disconnect that a lot of entrepreneurs feel on a daily basis. So can you tell us a little bit about your work, your background that led to you writing this book, and then we'll dig in. I started working with the YPO organization in probably about, I don't know, 17 years now. And I was teaching them some of these basic concepts and they kept asking, where can we read more? Where do we learn more? How do we get more into the details? And there wasn't anything that I could point to. So we decided to write this book, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, and start a consulting group specifically to train people on these very specific tools, really practical tools that people could use to help them learn how to be less reactive. Because what we saw were these really wonderful, thoughtful, intelligent human beings who were burnt out, who were reactive, who weren't sleeping nights. And it just helped me like, this is crazy making. You're here trying to help the world. And yet you yourself are really struggling. How do we help you? How do we help you specifically in two ways? One, how do we help you recognize you might be doing too much? And I do think that's a key. Yeah, sometimes we're just taking on too much. And there's an edge, of course, because most of you are entrepreneurs who are interested in biting off a little more than you can chew, which is great. But how do you know that edge where that's enough? And then the other piece is, as you're just working with whatever projects you're on, how can you do it from a place of trust versus threat? And that's our specialty at the Conscious Leadership Group. And that's what the book is all about is how do we help you learn to shift when you are reactive, when you're in contraction? Because when you're reactive and contracting, it takes a lot of energy to then work and it's not sustainable. And so what we're up to is how do we help you as an individual be sustainable? How do we help your teams be sustainable so that you can do the good work that you're here to do? I feel like so many of us, myself, you know, at the, at, the, at the lead of this for a decade have been talking about the upcoming transformation of healthcare. COVID ushered in so many horrible things for so many people, but for entrepreneurs trying to transform healthcare, working to transform healthcare, investors working to transform healthcare, there was this jarring event that began 18 months ago and almost changed the game overnight. And so how has your work if it all shifted or changed beginning in you know early 2020 as a result of the pandemic? 
I would say there's a lot more people interested in it because, you know, the more we're dealing in this complex, chaotic world, the more we're going to have to need our wits about us, which means the more present we need to be. And so people are recognizing how important paying attention to presence, paying attention to being conscious in the moment is needed to be able to navigate such changing times. So we've got three different exercises we're going to do today with you. You, you know, I asked the question uh, when we spoke, if you were to really make the best use of people's time today in less than an hour, what would be the three kind of exercises and discussions you would do? So I'm going to let you introduce both all three, but then the first one that we're going to dig into. Okay, great. So let's start with the big picture. So I'm going to have us play a three minute video that's going to give you an understanding of the difference between above the line and below the line, which is a model we use. And the video does a better job than me at explaining it. So we'll start here. ...themselves over and over is, where am I? To support leaders in locating themselves as they ask the question, where am I? We offer this tool, a line, a simple black line. At any moment, all leaders and all people are either above the line or below the line. Our location describes how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. If we're above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. Stop right now and simply ask yourself, where am I? In this now moment, am I above the line or below the line? Typically, when people are below the line, they believe certain things about the world. For example, they believe there is not enough. It could be that there's not enough money or time or space, or energy, or love. People below the line also believe that their story about the situation is right. People below the line also believe that there is a threat out there. Something or someone is threatening their desire for approval, control, or security. And people below the line see the situation as serious. The deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line tend to behave certain ways as well. They tend to cling to an opinion, find fault and blame, gossip, explain, rationalize and justify, get overwhelmed, and avoid conflict or pursue conflict for the sake of winning. When people are above the line, they believe that learning and growing are more important than being right. They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? One thing to know as you consider this question, we are hardwired to go below the line. Literally, our brain is programmed to perceive threat, and when it does, a chemical cocktail courses through our veins, and we go below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive in the presence of a real threat to our physical survival. An issue for modern day leaders is that often our brains can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or identity. We react and get defensive when we experience a threat to our ego. So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. But when we are below the line, we're not in a state, literally brain state, of high creativity collaboration, innovation, and relational connection. We're simply trying to survive. Leaders today can't thrive if they're in survival mode. So the first activity of conscious leadership is location, location, location. In this now moment, where am I? Telling ourselves and others the truth about our current location begins the great conversation. If you know me, you know, the first 50 times at least that I played that video, I would go below the line and get scared. People are going to think that I think dinosaurs and humans were on the planet together at the same time. <laughs> I, would, I would get scared. Like, I, I hope they know, I know that's not true, but there would be this threat. And then I'd start to try to facilitate already in a bit of a threatened state. So it's great. I've watched that enough times. I don't have to, uh, I've done my deep work. So I don't have my threat to my approval anymore. So here's the big idea. The big idea is we're just going to pay attention to am I above the line or below the line? And just like the video said, we're wired to go below the line. It's not bad or wrong. 
My experience is the average human can handle zero to four seconds of being above the line before we go back down below the line. That's pretty normal. I'm not interested in saying that we need to stop being below the line. That would be crazy making. It'd be like saying, stop breathing. <laughs> so there's intelligences that have us go into reactivity, but it's not always the threat that we perceive and we can shift. So that's what we're going to be about today is helping you start to be able to locate yourself in finding some tools to shift. So first thing I want you to do is I want you to grow in some self-awareness about how do you go below the line? So we've got a handout that we're gonna share here in the chat. And you can, if you have the ability to sit and download that or look at that, you can start to take a look at just the lower half of this handout. And you're gonna start to identify what are your unique ways you go below the line? So I'll give everybody a minute to click on that and bring that handout up who's available to do so. And I'd, lo I'd love to ask a question as people are bringing this up, because I'm just going to be very practical. The hour before we started this, I was in a meeting with a couple of people and I started the meeting above the line. And I think everybody that showed up on the call did as well. Yep. But it didn't take very long for not only one person to go above the line, but then everybody to get dragged down. Can we just talk for a moment as you set up this exercise about that, that, that acknowledgement moment where it really makes a difference and it doesn't go too far and that everything's dragged down and it devolves into, you know, everybody being frustrated. Yeah. So the first thing would be the first person who recognizes their below line could speak up and say, hold on a minute, I'm getting reactive and I'm losing my ability to be in a high state of learning. So let me first just take a moment and pause, take a breath and see if I'm willing to shift. Now, I might not even say that out loud. I might just do that in myself. Check you out, Diana. You're getting reactive here in this meeting. Can you just notice where are you? And let's see if we can have you walk yourself back into a state of trust again. And sometimes the whole team will, and a meeting will go, we're all below the line. And then there's, you know, we can just welcome, okay, we're all reactive. And rather than continuing down this conversation with all of us so reactive, maybe we might want to just take a few minutes to presence what's going on for us so that we can shift and then go back to the content. And we might not even be able to shift and that's okay. Then we're just going to recognize we've got some threat here going on as we're making decisions. And then we're just aware. So you've got this handout in front of you. And what I'd like you to do is look at that bottom half of the handout and start on that left hand column. And I'd like you to circle. If I were to walk around over the last two months and I saw you being reactive when you did, what two statements would I hear you say the most? So you're just going to take a look and all you're doing here is just so like for me, one of them is it's hard. I know when I say it's hard, I'm in reactivity. That's one of my go-to statements when I'm struggling. What, so I want you just to see if you can find a couple for yourself under statements. And then I'd like you to go to the next column under behaviors. Again, if I followed you around over the last couple of months, when you got reactive, what two behaviors did you most likely engage in? If you were to grow in some self-awareness, just pick two. And then again, go to the next column under beliefs. When you're triggered and reactive, what two beliefs does your mind tend to really want to grip around? For me, it's, I need to be in control, especially of things I can't control. So my mind wants to start believing I need to be in control of these things. And then that's going to secure my reactivity. That's going to secure me being in a state of threat. And some of you might have questions like, what does this statement mean? Or why is this here? So feel free, I want this to be interactive. Feel free to just speak up and ask any questions that you have about the content you see on this handout. Some people ask um, the question, why are why questions on that list? Because we use why questions at our company and we find them very valuable. And I would say you can use why questions from above the line where you're deeply curious. And then you can also use why questions from below the line, which is like, why are you crying? You know, instead of like, the person may not know why they're crying. I'm just letting some flow come through. Or why did this happen? Instead of like, who can we blame? Instead of, hey, what do we get to learn from this particular scene that we couldn't learn any other way? And the why questions might keep us from opening up to something more than just the quick answer that why is looking for. 
So let's let's um, see if people are willing. We're going to be recording this, and so I only want you to speak up if you feel willing to have your voice be heard by not just this group, but whoever hears this later. But if you're willing to, I'd love to hear understatements, and you can either put it in the chat or you can speak out. But what two statements did you circle? The statements I, I did was, you made me and I have to. <laughs> Great. You make me and I, you made me and I have to. And then are you willing to keep playing? What behaviors did you circle? Yeah, cling to an opinion. Cling to an opinion. That's one of my favorites too. And then how about over in beliefs? I need another's approval. I need another's approval. Wonderful. Great. And so what you're doing is just growing in some self-awareness of, oh, these are my favorite ways, favorite meaning based on the results <laughs> of how I go below the line. And the idea being then that when you've seen if we can have you start to be able to have a pause in your awareness to notice when these patterns show up. So let's use chat because that's a fun thing to do. Let's have everybody who's willing to post in chat. What are the statements or what's the number one statement? We'll start that way. They don't get it. Yeah, I'm confused. I'm trying. I'm sorry. I have to. These are all statements when we're in a state of victimhood. And victimhood is something is happening and I don't take full charge that I'm the creator here. That's what victimhood is about. It's happening to me. It's not happening by me. And so when I'm in that mindset of it's happening to me, the thing you can count on is you're going to suffer. There's, there's going to be a way that you're going to have to use more energy to manage the scene. And that's the part that creates a lot of burnout for people. How about behaviors? What behaviors do you see? Hold your breath. Yeah, that's a good one. I often watch people just, they start to look at their devices and they immediately start holding their breath. That's a great way to tire yourself. Or they see an email come in and it just, all they have to do is read the person's name and they start holding their breath. Let's go to beliefs. Use the chat. What beliefs do you get caught in when you're in your reactivity? Yeah, I need another's approval. There are only two options. That's a great way. That's how you know you're in the below the line mindset is there's only two options because from above the line, there's a lot more options. There's a threat to me. I need to get to a solution. Great. There's a right and wrong way. So for those of you who want to take the uh, masterclass, take this handout, circle, you know, you could physically circle these things, hand it to people who you work with and say, hey, I want to grow an awareness to see my patterns of reactivity. I circled these, what do you think? Did I do a pretty good job? Or are there some others that you think you see in me on a regular basis that I wanna become more aware of? You could also go home and do the same thing. You can also assign it as a homework assignment to people who work around you. Would you fill it in? I'm not even gonna give you a hint. Would you just fill in two for each column for me so that I can start to see how others are perceiving my reactivity. It's a great thing to do as a team exercise at an offsite or, or all hands meeting where people start to build some awareness. So to Diane, I have a question for you around almost the answers that, at least from my perspective, when you asked, I stuck at all of the options below the line. What's the, what's the flip question here to kind of ask about when we can recognize we're truly in that zone of above the line? Yeah. So then the question would be, if people say, I feel like I'm in a state of trust, I would say, how do you know? And you're going to look and see these statements and behaviors and beliefs I see above the line in the handout. I can feel myself aligned with those. So you're going to want to get good at, oh, like, oh, the behaviors when I'm above the line, I'm really listening. I'm speaking unarguably. I'm in a state of appreciation. I feel playful. I'm opening my breath. Those are keys. And so the behaviors column in particular will give you lots of indicators for how you know you're above the line. Do you see both your clients and entrepreneurs walk around with this? Yes. As, I mean, literally, you know, almost as an important indicator of whatever it's a meeting or you're by yourself kind of getting used to each of these statements, which we all go to so quickly. Yeah. And pre-COVID, when people were physically with each other, a lot of teams were putting these up next to their desks. So if we were having a meeting and you come to me and have a meeting, like you're going to see, here's my patterns. And they'd make agreements with each other. Like if you notice I'm getting reactive and I've circled these things for you to, you know, that likely might show up, I'd love feedback if you're seeing it in the moment. So we can start to support each other because we're not interested in like playing a gotcha game and policing each other, but we're more interested in like, oh, hey, it looks like 
there's a threat happening over there. And I want to be in service of making sure that you're coming back into more of a state of trust so that this can be a high learning conversation. One of the core values at Startup Health, everybody knows who's in our community, is about being batteries included rather than batteries not included. And we all can be both, as we know. And I think what you illustrated here with very clear statements is when are we being batteries included to a conversation, either self-talk or with others, or being batteries not included? Is there a stigma to the what you said happens to all of us, we end up there? Like, because it felt, it, it feels sometimes when you're being batters not included and not being able to kind of articulate why or how to get out of it. What would you say is the best tool to kind of trigger the behavior change in a meeting or with yourself? Well, once I can locate myself. So the first thing I'd want, if I could assign it all to you, I'd say, get good at locating yourself. Just spend the next month. And I actually recommend my clients use your phone and there's an app we call Mind Jogger and have your phone ask you multiple times during the day, which mine does, Diana, where are you? So when it pops up, I stop and pause and I go, oh, <laughs> I'm up below the line. I didn't even notice. Or, oh yeah, I am above the line. So I'm, I'm just getting good at locating. Then when I notice I'm below the line, I just recognize I'm below the line because I perceive a threat. I'm scared. Can it be okay to be scared and triggered? Can I just welcome that? Because most of us are like, stop being scared, stop being threatened. We make that bad and wrong. So I just scared I'm triggered. No big deal. I'm just human. I mean, we're just, we're all so human here. So that's the next step. And then the question would be, would I be willing to shift out of that threatened state? And it probably 80% of the time, the answer is no. If you're like most of my clients and myself, the answer is no, I'm not willing. I have still some reactivity over here, which is fine. Then you just get to learn something about that. But 20% of the time, you're going to go, yeah, I'm willing to shift. And so especially about those little things, like I just got judgmental because my colleague showed up five minutes after we were supposed to meet. And now I'm focused on how they did it wrong. And I'm not really present in the meeting. So can I just shift myself in that moment so I can come back to curiosity? So that, that would be like those little moments. Those are usually pretty easy to shift. So we created the 15 commitments because they're 15 tools that you can use to shift yourself. And what I'd like to do is to go through with you very briefly, the first six commitments, they're the foundational ones, and give you a sense of what it means to notice when you're below the line and use one of these tools to bring yourself back up. This is the 15 commitments handout. And so that's the kind of the short version of the book right there that goes through all the topics. If you feel called to pull that out and some of the teams actually print these out and have these around so they can use this as a guide to notice, where am I um, in each of these commitments? So we're going to start with commitment number one, which is I commit to take full responsibility for the circumstances of my life instead of I commit to blaming others and myself. Let me give you an example of a recent conversation I had with a client in which he works for the CEO and his complaint was I'm not getting the feedback I want from the CEO to really learn and grow. I want to develop myself as a leader. And so this man came to me blaming the CEO. He was below the line blaming. It's his fault. I'm not getting the feedback I want. So what I did is I said, I want to work for my CEO and I want to make sure I don't get the feedback from my CEO the way you don't get the feedback from yours. I want to create exactly the same issue in my life. And I want to follow your script. So what should I do? And so he went, what? You mean I'm supposed to tell you how I created him not giving me feedback? I said, absolutely. So he started to go, well, well, first of all, I guess, believe his time is more valuable than yours. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, secondly, don't ask for it. Don't be really outward about I want sp specific feedback. Uh, thirdly, Judge his past feedback is probably not helpful. And so maybe you don't really want to hear his feedback. So he kept going for a while and started to realize, oh, I'm creating the lack of feedback. Now, of course, the CEO has their part to play and we could interview them and ask them to teach the course. How are you creating somebody not feeling well supported? 
who is being mentored by you. We could we could ask them that. But for now, we stay out of that person's business and we just stay with the client saying, how am I creating the result I'm complaining about? So what I'd like is for you to put up the handout on teach the class. So this is a tool that I use reliably with my clients. It's one of my most favorite tools. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think of an issue that you're complaining about, ideally at work. Now, some of you might prefer to deal with an issue you're complaining about in your personal life, and that's fine. And if you want some any support with this or you want to share the class, pick an issue that you'd be willing to reveal to this group. So you're going to find what's something you're complaining about. It could be somebody doesn't keep their agreements with me regularly at work, or somebody's always late to a meeting, or I just don't think my CFO is as competent as they could be, or my kid's not doing their homework and it's a real struggle at home, or you know, the house is a mess and my roommate uh, or you know, my roommates or my family isn't cleaning up. Whatever your complaint is, I want you to pick an issue. And I want you to imagine that Stanford called and they want you to teach this class on how to create this issue that you're complaining about. And you are going to be a professor. And I'd like you to name the class, you know, you know, how to keep a messy house 101, or how to have your team not give you any good feedback. And this is a PhD class, you know, like how good are you at this? Be playful with this. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna imagine that you're gonna create five steps. What are the five steps that we all should take if we wanted to create the exact same issue you're complaining about and we do it just like you've created it? So ideally, what I'd like is for all of you just to take a couple of minutes and you can use the questions in this handout. You don't have to use all of them, but they might be guides to like, oh yeah, what action did I take or did I not take? And what did I have to believe and be right about in order to create this result? So you're going to give your five steps. And then ideally what I'd love is if a couple of you would teach your course to the whole group. So we get to have a good laugh. And I, I really like to amp it up like, <clears throat> hello, Professor Chapman. Let's see what's, a, oh, I could teach a course. How to have an adversarial relationship with your neighbor. If you too want to have an adversarial relationship, sign up for my course. I can teach you exactly how to do that. I really, as I told you before the call, Diana, I took this exercise, put it right into play on a call that I had with one of our health transformers yesterday afternoon, as he was telling me all of the bad things that are happening to him by everybody else. And how just mentioning this idea was a jarring kind of pause. How, how do you see entrepreneurs just once they've done this once or twice, kind of using it as like the above the line, below the line, using it in there every day to kind of change their behavior. Yeah. So the, the idea is if I'm ever blaming or feeling like I'm at the effect of the circumstances out there, I'm just going to recognize, oh, I'm below the line. I'm in a victim mindset. So rather than acting as if I have nothing to do with these results, let me shift and teach the course. So many of my clients say, Diana, all day long, I catch myself in victimhood. And then I just look at and see what are the three to five steps that I created here to get to this result. And I come back and what they report is they feel so much more empowered. They start to recognize, oh, I have something to do with this. And the good news is if I take responsibility for how I'm co-creating the scene, I then can learn how to shift it. Excellent. Excellent. Natalie Davis, uh, you can introduce yourself quickly and then teach us how developers are always late with releases. Oh, no. Oh, no. I knew you were going to call on me, Stephen. Okay. So we, we say, um, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Davis is in the house and uh, we are very privileged to have her here. She's going to be teaching us all a course. Welcome, Professor Davis. Today, I am teaching developers are late with our software releases and Obviously, I am trying to control something that is not in my control. Here's a question for you. Did you make really clear agreements about who will do what by when with these developers? Yes. You did. You made really clear agreements like time, day, hour, what they're going to deliver on. Yes. Gantt okay. chart. So you did that. Gantt chart to the hour. Great. However, sometimes... We are the ones that are wrong. How, how do you, what do you mean wrong? Sometimes when something is not like we decided it would be, it's our own fault. Got it. 
but specifically teach me how to make sure they don't, because it sounds like they don't keep their time agreements with you. Is that right? Yes. Great. And I want you to teach me, how do you make sure they don't keep their time agreements with you? We'd say the results are, as you report, that they're not keeping their time agreements. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. And it's not like you woke up this morning and said, hot damn, another day for the team not to keep their time agreements with me. You didn't consciously <laughs> choose that, right? Right. Right. But unconsciously, right. there's a part of you who's co-creating that result because that's what's happening. And what right. we're looking for is for you to wake up in consciousness of how do I keep creating them not keeping their agreements? So I hear, I did make very clear agreements. Who's going to do what by when I did do that with them. Now, what happens when they break it? What happens then that has like, when they break it, it sounds like you don't clarify, like you don't express your anger. You don't have consequences. Like what are the things that you do that keep this pattern repeating? Luckily, I have a wonderful CEO who is better, so much better at this than I am. But I would say if that's the result, the CEO is in on it too. Like the whole team is in on it. Everybody, right. everybody right. Is creating the scene, right? Yes, yes. So what happens in organizations right. yes. is everybody wants to go, it's them. Yes. You know, they keep not delivering. Yes. And I want to say to leadership, how are you creating okay. them not okay. delivering? It's not like, okay. let's get out of their business for a minute. Does that make yeah, sense? Well, Yes. What, what, what I what I heard you ask, Diana, is, is is really interesting, and I just want to double back to it, which is what's your role in the lateness of the delivery? And I heard Natalie say, "I change. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be, or it didn't come out the way I thought." And so you asked a very important question in a situation where we aren't taking responsibility. Is am I correct in? In, in the replication of teaching the course, it would be make dates that you agree on and then change your mind after you see it and decide that you don't want it. That's how you recreate the situation. Is that, is, am I thinking about this right? Is that, is that your experience, Natalie? I, I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, great. So the idea being, what's the thing I'm complaining about and how am I co-creating it? So for example, when the, I have somebody who says, nobody on my team, he's a CEO, nobody on my team gives me feedback. And so I always ask, does, do people have ideas? And nobody gives them to me. So I said, teach me a course. I want to not have my team give me feedback the way you have it. So he says, well, come in with a really sure idea about how things should be. When people do give me feedback from the past, tell them how their idea isn't really the right idea. Don't listen really thoughtfully to them when they are speaking. And so they start to realize, oh, I'm creating the thing I'm complaining about. And I wrote down these steps. And then I say, you don't need a coach or a therapist or anybody else. All you have to do is go do the opposite of these things you just wrote down and okay. you're going to get a different result. So, okay. so I, I love it. We, we've got another person who wants to teach a class. Okay, great. Uh, Greg Jackson, who we heard from earlier, is ready to teach a class. Professor Jackson. Hey there. Hello again. Yeah, so my class is you're moving too quickly. You're moving too quickly. So is this somebody and, is this some is this you you're moving too quickly or somebody in your team? No, I'm I'm moving too you're quickly. You're moving too quickly. Got it. Okay. So the complaint yeah. is I move too quickly. How do you create moving too quickly? Well, part of it is based on my my ego. I spent 25 years in Silicon Valley and a, a whole bunch of massive, I'm in the med tech field and we had so many massive successes. I mean, how can you not be successful in Silicon Valley with MedTech? But anyway, or, or high tech, I mean, just so easy. I just say easy. And, and I bring that to, I, I work at a med tech and equipment companies and getting them into the digital ecosystem. So I, it's like, move, 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 move. It's so, to me, it's so easy to do. We've done this so many times, but companies around the world don't know how to do that. So what, my, my number one way of doing it <laughs> to move too quickly, develop timelines without getting any feedback from anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So don't get don't get feedback from the other team members about whether this timeline is actually really realistic. Nah, they don't know what they're doing. I know better than them. Like just, right. just drive it. Excellent. Number two, no number two, no better than everybody else. Right. Um, number three, berate the team. Okay, great. Berate you, the team. You've never done this. You're used to going slowly. You're used to you're from such and such part of the world. You're slower than the Silicon Valley people. Got By the way, it. please, please, I don't agree with any of this. I'm drama. You asked us to dramatize it yes. and go with it. So please, I don't believe, and I 
most of the time don't do most of this. Well, I would say uh, when you're in your pattern, unconsciously, you do believe it. And that's the whole idea is we're all waking up that in those moments, I don't consciously believe this, but some part of me believes we got to go fast. And some part of me is at threat that, and some part of me isn't as collaborative in those moments. I, 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 that's too much for me. I'm going to, I'm going to have to reflect on this later. I get you, but I know I got <laughs> okay. you. I got you, but I don't got you. Right. So my number four is be rate upper management, be rate them for going too slow. They're taking too much time making, making decisions, not getting the budget, tying into quote unquote, we don't have that as part of the strategy. We'll get back to you later. And is this something that sometimes happens, Greg, for you, where you berate them? You know, I, I don't overtly berate them. I'm sure I have to be on, at times I'm in my head. Why are they taking so long? Okay, why so are they berate not, them? Because what I'm looking accept. for is how do you do it? I'm not looking for like, hey, here's a class on how somebody might do it. I'm looking for how do you do it? So it might be- berate I berate them. senior management. The rate right in your hand, management in your head and be right, they should go faster. Yes. Got well it. Said. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. And I guess number four, number four is my experience in Silicon Valley is better than everybody else's because we know better in Silicon Valley. Okay. Great. Believe that my pace is better and the pace we do it at Silicon Valley is the right way. Okay. And then one more. Oh, those were five. Oh, those are five. Great. I thought you had said four. Okay, great. So then you get to go, oh, I don't wake up consciously and say, I want to move too fast. But unconsciously, when I'm below the line of reactive, I'm committed to moving too fast. And this is how I create that result. It's exactly what we're going after here. So yeah. this is one of my favorite shift. <laughs> that was so, deep. That was so deep, Diana. Can you repeat that again, please? You don't wake up and say, yeah, another day to go too fast. But on those days when you are going too fast, you're unconsciously committed to going too fast. And there's a certain way you organize yourself to create that result. If you really want to be a more effective leader, you want to learn, how do I set it up? What do I have to believe in my head? What do I have to do with my team or not with my team that has me going too fast? And if I can learn how I do it, I can learn how I can undo it. That's the practice. So, so Diane, I mean, we, we could dig into this all day because I think you're, you're hitting on this theme throughout this entire session about being conscious of your role with other people involved in it. I want to make sure we do a time check on, we've got about, you know, 11 minutes left. I want to make sure your third topic here, especially when one of the other commitments gets touched on, because this is, I think, so relevant to today where everybody's feeling like, to Greg's point, we need to move faster, but is the train keeping up with us as an organization? Good. So let's keep the one about we need to move faster because almost everybody I coach has that story. Now, there's two ways to be with that story. We need to move faster. From below the line, you're going to grip around it and you're going to be right. We got to move faster. We got to move faster. And you're going to be in a state of threat with that story. And you're going to create drama around you when you want to grip hard on that. Versus, hey, we've got some competition. We'd like to be first you know, in line here ultimately. So we would like to move faster. We think that's probably a better idea. However, we're open. We're available to learn. Maybe we need to go a little slower. Maybe you gotta go slower to go faster. Like what we gotta learn, what is the pace that's really gonna allow us to win the game? And so from commitment number two is, would I be willing to let go of being right? And that's what it means to be right is to grip around something tightly, righteously, versus I'm willing to open and learn. What's the pace that would most support us being effective in coming to market to be able to get this product out and also allow us all to be sustainable? Excellent. So I want, I'd love to, I know you, you talk about the six of the 15 are the foundation. Yes, so let's keep rolling. Yeah. Right. So the next one is I commit to feel my feelings. One of the things I notice in the startup world is a lot of us have visions of where we're going to be and they don't come to fruition as fast as we thought. And we don't let ourselves grieve. A lot of entrepreneurs aren't letting themselves be sad. <laughs> Darn, I thought we'd have this many users by now. Darn, I thought we'd have the science by now. And would you be willing to let it be okay to feel your feelings? Or, hey, I feel angry. 
This meeting feels like, oh, this doesn't feel like a good use of my time to be in this meeting. And there's an intelligence of my anger that says, change this pattern. Or this meeting in general just doesn't seem to be effective for any of us. Can we welcome anger as an intelligence as much as our sadness and our fear? And then also, I have a lot of companies for whom people complain, we never celebrate our successes. We're just pushing on to the next thing and we never get to experience joy and really be able to say, wow, look what we've done so far. So are we letting those feelings come through is a big practice for us to be able to be more present. I see a lot of people repress their emotions with their colleagues because they don't want to have conflict or upset anybody. And then they have to literally depress on themselves to hold those emotions down in the body. And it's exhausting. And one of the ways I see people really tire themselves is by not letting themselves move those feelings all the way through and out of the body. What's your go-to tool for that in 30 seconds around how to really let that happen? Just can you locate when you have a feeling it's going to show up as a sensation in the body? So for example, sadness is usually in the chest, anger is up the back, neck, jaws, and fear is in the belly. Can you find the sensation in the body and can you help learn to move it all the way through by breathing with it, making a little sound or movement to help it actually leave the body? That somatic practice is so important for sustainability. Love it, love it. All right, number four. Number four is candor. So again, a lot of us have thoughts and stories that we don't share with each other. We repress them and that causes, again, a lot of us to get exhausted and it causes us to get disconnected from our colleagues. So can we have candor? Can we tell each other honestly what's going on? And can we listen? Can we be a space that people can speak and we will really hear them and get them? I'm shocked when I sit in on meetings with my clients how little listening is actually occurring. And so those are that's a practice to be able to listen and speak candidly. Commitment five is all around gossip. So one of the things we say is, if you want to trust in a culture, eliminate as best you can gossip because gossip is a great way for people not to feel like they can relax into trusting each other. I, I want to touch on this one. This was the one I told you yesterday that I actually stopped listening to the Audible book and made a phone call to somebody who cl claims they don't gossip, but listens to a lot of it. And then I get the call and I listen to a lot of it. And I didn't consider myself, and I know they didn't consider themselves gossipers, but that responsibility thing played right into that. So can you just talk a little bit about dissecting gossip? It's not just about doing it by yeah. talking. Yes. So gossip isn't just, isn't just talking. It takes two to gossip. So somebody has got to be listening. So if you're coming to me regularly telling me a colleague, you know, John over there is really ineffective uh, and, and Sue really doesn't keep her agreements. I want to go, are you going and having those conversations directly with them so that you can actually solve the issue? Or do you keep temporarily relaxing yourself by venting to me and you get a little relief, but you actually just never solve the problem. And therefore it is unsustainably repeating over and over again. And so this is a biggie in a lot of teams. And especially a lot of people relieve themselves by going home and gossiping to their significant others about their colleagues and they get a little relief, but it doesn't change the pattern unless they go directly to the people for whom they have an issue. So what's the actual discussion look like when someone starts? Yeah, it looks like, hey, I want to acknowledge, I want to, first of all, separate out some facts and stories. So what are the facts? The facts are you and I make agreements to uh, meet uh, once a week. The facts are that the clock strikes at the top of the hour when we agree to meet and you're not there. The facts are you show up anywhere from three to 10 minutes past when we agreed upon. Those are the facts. The story I make up is you're not responsible or you don't value my time, or a whole bunch of other stories I might make up. I want to let you know what I feel, and I want to tell you what I need and want. And there's a whole process called the clearing model that we have on our website that people can use to start to have those candid conversations and take ownership for any re reactivity you have. Love it. Love it. All right, let's do number six. Number six is all around integrity. And we say integrity is energetic wholeness, meaning that there's something that's just in a nice flow. If something's out of integrity, there's like a, a break in the system, like when a light in a Christmas tree strand goes out, we would say that strand that is out of integrity. We want to make sure that that electricity is flowing all the way through. And there are different ways that we break integrity 
by not keeping our agreements in particular, this commitment is focused on. So I can't tell you how many people have drama at work because who is going to do what by when was not clarified. So there are so many either unclear agreements or broken agreements. We don't have consequences for agreements. So one of the things we work with clients on a lot is how do we tighten those up? What are decision rights around agreements? A lot of companies don't explore decision rights. We have a fantastic video on that so that people can say, hey, do we have a decision to make in this meeting? Yes, what are the decision rights? Is it leader decides, leader decides with input, committee decides, is it consensus? Is it all alignment? What is it? Majority rules. Let's clarify what is the decision right. And then let's make sure that we then make that clear agreement with each other so that we, and that we keep our agreements. I, I, there is so much good, (laughs) good actionable stuff from today that I know will resonate with so many of the health transformers. We have time for one question. And then I want to move into what we call a positive focus, which is giving a little bit of love back about what people took away from both the exercises, the tools, and the discussion. And I want to encourage everybody, if you haven't already bought the book or downloaded the book or listened to the audible version of it, there is each chapter chock full of actionable wisdom. Uh, Diana, thank you so much. You're um, so welcome. Question or, or, or positive focus for Diana as we wrap up. First of all, uh, Diana, thank you so much for, for being here. My name's Unity Stokes, and I've, I've read the book once and listened to it once, and I really enjoy the audio, audible version. I love the, uh, your concept of commitment nine about play, um, because as, as you transition to sustainable, um, I found for myself anyway, trying to make it fun is one of those things that actually makes it sustainable. So you codifying all of this is, has been transformative for us. So thank you. You are so welcome. And especially in the healthcare, you know, people can get serious, all these diseases and people suffering. We can get, we can get serious in lockdown. And to your point, it starts, the more serious we get, the less we breathe, the less we're moving our bodies, um, the less curious we are. And so that's not sustainable. So bringing some levity and some play in is so key. I love that you're standing for that. I want to honor one of the commitments of ending on time as much as I would love to continue the conversation. Diana, thank you. Thank you so much for not only codifying this with your, your, your partners, but really doing the work that so many of us need to achieve our health moonshot. So thank you for spending the hour codifying it. Look forward to many more conversations. For those of you who joined us today, I'm so glad you had a chance to just experience the magic of the 15 commitments of the conscious leader. And I want to remind you that we have these sessions once a month for everybody in the community every week for our health transformers. And tomorrow we have a webinar for our new Startup Health Moonshots Impact Fund. And so if you're an accredited investor or a qualified investor and a firm that invests in great entrepreneurs like the ones that are in our community, please join us for our webinar, startuphealth.com slash webinar. Diana, thank you. And thank you all of you for joining us today. Take care. Mm-hmm.